Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am pretty excited about today. I know I say that a lot, but I I truly mean it because my guest today was the redheaded queen of ultra hardcore performances in the 2000s and has more than 30 AVNs to her name. And in January, she was finally inducted into the AVN Hall of Fame. Me too. Congratulations. Thank you. It took us long enough, huh? I felt like that slightly, but you know. (laughs) (laughs) She took a few years off from the industry, but is now back performing, and I am so excited to hear about this new era of her career. Welcome, Audrey Hollander. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So uh, I just want to say when you first reached out to me, I was very excited. I am fangirling a little bit. I didn't want to say this before the podcast because I thought it would be more exciting. Um, But I, uh, when I first started working in the industry, and you came in like after I first started, but when I think I like really started to kind of shoot more and all that kind of stuff, you were having this meteoric rise. And I was like a big fan of you and your scenes because you were like one of those girls who was like beautiful but also did like ultra hardcore shit which I kind of liked thank you Um, so I always was like kind of in awe of you so to have you like sitting here in the studio with me is is a little bit it's a little bit weird for me. I feel kind of the same about you <laughs> because I've been a fan of not only your mother's work, but knowing that you're her protege. Is mm-hmm. that okay I to say? say? Yeah. yeah, I um I've always wanted to work with you. And so it was an honor to come meet you today and to finally get to get to know you. And yeah. I mean, we've been in the industry together for so long that it's strange that we haven't got to have this yet, but I'm Very happy. Yeah. Did you, because back in the day, there was like groups of people that were like, oh, only real boobs and only uh, fake boobs. Some some companies would only shoot real boobs. Was Mm. that you? No, you're thinking more like Stephen Hicks. We would shoot like, I think whoever was hot, but also because we shot for the magazine so much back then, they also had big pull. So it was like, it wasn't even just about who we wanted to shoot. It was about who high society wanted, who club wanted and stuff like that. So a lot of times they would make those decisions. Okay. So. That's interesting. Do you prefer natural or augmented? I don't really care. Um, I don't care. I mean, for me, like, it's all about the performer behind it, right? And, you know, obviously, like, how they're all put together and then, you know, how they perform. I mean, I've shot some of the most, like, they walk in and they're, like, the most beautiful girls. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then I get them in front of the camera and they just kind of die. Because, they, do, you know what I mean? Like, they're just not a good, like, a good model it's not exactly about how you look all the time. It's how you present yourself in front of the camera. Some girls yes. know how to do that and other girls don't. Yes. So some girls would come in and they'd be just kind of like, they just like melt. Not in a good way. You'd just be like, ugh. And I then do know. I'd have I some do. girls walk in and I'd be like, I don't know about that one. But then like hair and makeup later, get them in front of the camera and like they transform into something else. So much of it is about like that confidence and that inner that inner model, you know? I totally agree. Absolutely. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, How did you get into the adult industry in the first place? Okay. Well, (laughs) I was on holiday in Miami um, from my second semester of college, and I met my first husband, Otto Bauer. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I was with my girlfriends and we were on Ocean, is it Drive or Boulevard that's on the beach? I don't know Miami at all. Well, one is on the beach, one's not. So it's the one that was on the beach. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, there was a Blondie concert going on that night. I was like in full force, like, you know, feeling vibrant and young, like second semester in college. I'm going to Florida to Miami with my girlfriends. And well, her uncle that hosted us was like, oh, you know, we're going to get you girls all dolled up and we're going to go out and you never know. We're in Miami. You might meet someone that's going to whisk you away, right? So the, um, I guess the intention was kind of set in my mind by his dialogue then. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, you know, when you're young, you're super yeah. absorbent and impressionable. Yeah. And yeah. honestly, like, as I like think back on this, I'm like, He probably just put that idea in my head, and I was just, like, rolling with it because that evening I met Otto. Yeah. (laughs) He was um, basically across the dining area that Mm -hmm. we were at on Ocean 
Boulevard or Drive, whichever one it was. Mm -hmm. And um, he was staring at me. And so, like, finally I waved him over and he came over and started hanging out and talking. And basically after that, we, like, hung out that whole night, Mm -hmm. went to the beach, like, romantically later that evening. And, um, you know, it was love at first sight at that point for me. I was, oh, my goodness. And then he asked me to marry him. That night. That night? That night. Wow. Right? And so, like, there goes the story, the very beginning. And, yes, I was off to New York City to live with Otto and start a life there. (laughs) Wow. So did you drop out of college? I did. But I re-enrolled later on. But, I was yes, I was very much love drunk. (laughs) What was it about him that captivated you so much? His intellect. He was in school to uh, be—he was studying history and philosophy prior to his St. John's University, like, going to law school to be a criminal Mm -hmm. lawyer. Oh, wow. So um, good conversation is— a huge turn on for me. Yeah. Ever since I was young. Yeah. And so his ability to talk to me like I had never experienced before. I'm just this 19 year old girl that's like second semester in college. Like I'm like, whoa, this is yeah. amazing. Like, oh, I could have this conversation my whole life. I'm yeah. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah. So he was on a completely different trajectory. He was not yes. like getting into porn. Like that was not. So wh- how did that happen? Oh, this is such a good story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so off to New York City after our two week of um, getting to know each other and having fun in Miami. And of course, like the we had spent like most of the evening together and it was the morning he had like said, do you want to marry me? And mm-hmm. I was like, yes, you know, but so during that time we got to know each other and um, we moved to New York. He continued to go to school at St. John's and because I'm young and inexperienced, I was very threatened by his law school group of friends mm-hmm. and um, jealous, honestly. And so I was like, all right, let's see how much control I have over this. I don't like that you're in law school. I want you to quit law school. I want to move. I don't want to live here anymore. If you love me, you're not going to go to law school anymore, right? Like, you know, demanding this. I'm just a kid, though. I mean, yeah, come yeah, yeah. on, right? I don't, and so for him to have responded with, okay, and like, you know, oh, I love you too. And like, you mean so much to me that if this bothers you, we'll do something totally different. And so we start making a plan of like, where do we want to go next? Because New York was not where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, country girl in New York. I mean, it was fun. But after a while, I was just like overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so we chose New Orleans. Okay. Where our 15-year age difference didn't really get looked at as, like, scandalously as it did in New York City. Mm -hmm. So um, (laughs) it was was a cool town, though, to go move to. I wanted to go to Loyola University for elementary education, and then he went to Tulane um, to become an Episcopal priest. (laughs) <laughs> wow. I come from, this story is so many twists and turns. Well, oh, my God. I had come from a very religious upbringing. My mm-hmm. mom and dad, well, my dad's family was Baptist. My mom's family is Pentecostal, and they're, like, female, like, preachers on my mom's side. So heavily, like, ingrained in me was the religious thing most my childhood. Mm-hmm. And so he, I think, was catering to making me feel comfortable and— I mean, you know, a lawyer, a priest, they are people who are like high status in society, mm-hmm. which I think which— People listen to them. Exactly. They and get to like interpret certain pieces of doctrine. Right, yeah? okay, right. And sense. so I think that that's what drew him to that because he's very much an alpha, like what I considered a leader at the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I very much enjoyed all of his intellect and just mm-hmm. how smart he was. And so anyhow, he went to seminary. I went to school to be an elementary school teacher. And um, during that time, we're in New Orleans, which is a place where a lot of people drink. And so we developed some patterns of behavior that didn't really serve us later on in our relationship. And right. it caused problems because I was already displaying, like, you know, jealousy and just this young girl stuff that's inexperienced. And so I moved away from my whole support group in Kentucky, which is where I'm from and my family. And, um, yeah, so <laughs> we ended up in a way that I 
stop that career for him too eventually Mm -hmm. because there was no therapy or actually like getting to the root of like why we weren't you know, meshing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. We ended up in porn because I found out he was paying his way through law school as an escort. Right? Wow. And so here's the other part of the story. Sorry. I guess there's so much to it. So basically when we were in New Orleans and he was in school at Tulane and I was at Loyola, I found out in New York that he was escorting and I was like, oh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I want to try this too. And so that's what started me being a really heavy alcoholic because I had to take the alcohol in order to be comfortable to do the escorting. But I love this man so much that I wanted to understand. Right. Okay. What he was. Be brought into it. Experience it. Right. And so I did it. And well, you know, quick money is always like really amazing especially Mm -hmm. when you're that young you're like wow and this is easy and so Mm -hmm. I like took to it because I felt comfortable and he liked doing it and Mm -hmm. I saw him obviously he was doing it before he even got with me so I was like okay I want to please you I think more than anything and so I wanted to do it too and then the money was good so we were escorting together in New York and I got jealous about the law school like study group he actually got a blowjob from one of his friends but anyhow (laughs) I was like you know I'm the type of chick that was like okay I want to escort with you I'm good with you like having sex with me just not alone you know outside of us together right so so do you guys escort as a couple did you do sessions as a couple we did and we uh (laughs) we marketed towards the bi-curious couple Ah. Which, if you see the flow of the industry today and how, yeah. like, things have changed, like, it's so interesting how a lot of couples and guys are by, yeah. you know, curious, things like that. Yeah. It always ended up being a guy who was, like, more wanting to suck his dick in than, you know, I was there to keep it all straight. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I, you were, but, like, the heterosexual little, like, caring in there. They like, call it a Whoop. beard for people that, you know, the gay men, they don't want to admit that they're gay. They use a woman as a beard, is what I've heard. You were just there going, this is not gay, this is not gay, Well, everybody. I was actually into it, though, because I was so open and, like, you know, at that point when you're really young in your first love, you just want to please your person and like so that's all it was for me and I don't know it never really like sexual like connotation like whether you're male or female it just seemed so strange to have to like put labels on everything because I'm the type of person that I don't really care how you identify Mm -hmm. if I'm into you and I think you're sexy and we have that like emotional connection of some sort or Mm -hmm. chemistry I don't want to say emotional it's chemistry I Mm -hmm. guess um I'll I don't care so there is a label for you. You're okay. pansexual. Okay. Okay. So cool. I like this. I yeah. wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah. No, you're you're a pansexual. There's a label for everything. The label for people who don't want to be labeled is pansexual. <laughs> so as a pansexual person, that's... You're just attracted to people. It doesn't matter. Yes, yeah. I am. I you're am. attracted just to like the energy of somebody. Like the gender doesn't matter. The like identity, sexual right. identity doesn't matter. So like, it didn't bother me that there was this like, you know, kind of gay or bi thing going on with me there and i'm just laughing because it seems interesting to me that like the customer seemed to need you there so that he could feel like it wasn't super gay you know what i mean like that's 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 what makes me laugh it makes me laugh too but i guess it's just like it's a head game that people play with themselves but i wish that people would be more free with exploring their sexuality And and i think it's especially harder for men too. Right. Right. To like explore like being with another man because we're so, it's so stigmatized, you know, like if a girl makes out with a girl, it's like in college, it's like, oh, it's hot. Right. But if a guy does it, like that raises all these other issues and yeah. And guys aren't allowed to like talk about their feelings or, right. you know, so yeah, I think it's, I think it's hard for guys. I learned recently about a ceremony in South America that some cultures do. And it's, they give a uh, coca leaf with a uh, cacao mm-hmm. to the man before dinner so that he opens up and talks more, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which would make sense, but anyway, yeah. totally on a tangent. <laughs> is, that, is it cocaine? <laughs> well, it, yeah. Well, it's the leaf. Right, right. So, but not Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's cocaine in a leaf form. Well, I thought it was an interesting ritual, honestly. No. And um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of guys that do do cocaine and mm-hmm. the clients that came through <laughs> <laughs> that were bi curious and stuff, it definitely <laughs> opened them up to like that being less uncomfortable. But I think yeah. it's a beautiful thing. My favorite porn is 
gay porn, honestly. Yeah. I, I like it too. Yeah. And it's funny too, because I like, got, I'm very straight. I'm not really into women. I'm really into guys. Uh-huh. So like, and I almost never watch porn, but sometimes if I, if I do and I watch gay porn, it's like two of like the things that I like, like together. And I was like, oh, but... I yeah. also never, almost never watch porn, but yeah, I've I've seen some gay porn. And it's like, man, it's, it's hot sometimes. Found Gods um, is one of my favorites. It's like mm-hmm. really muscly men that are yeah. like, you know, in bondage. And, yeah, yeah. I'm an anal person, so yeah, I think that's why I like gay and bi, and I like how it's all becoming fluid anyhow mm-hmm. in this industry. And yeah. I I love all the beautiful trans women that have come into our industry. It's yeah, really cool. So different, right? Yeah, I like it. So okay, so um. So you guys are escorting together. Right. How did that lead to porn? <laughs> so we're escorting and he is in school to be a priest, right? And like, I'm like. It's so good. It's like it, a fucking Netflix show. It totally is. And I mean, this is so, it's like, you can't make this shit up. Uh, it's crazy. So I am, it's like, he explained it to me, like how to like, you know, convince me that this is okay morally and ethically because like, you know, we're in church and shit and we're escorting to pay our way through school and and you came from a very religious background right right so he's like do you think that jesus really cares about what you're doing with your genitalia <laughs> i mean like, fair that was question. like the caveat like at the beginning of the conversation and i was like huh well that's you know let me think about this and he's like you know, we're a couple and we are consenting to doing this together. And, you know, what other people do, like, you know, at home or if they're married, people coming to see us, our service is maybe going to make that man or woman go home and buy their wife flowers or, you know, they'll learn how to please her Mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. trying to find that silver lining and what we're doing. But I mean, I'm always like that because I do feel like you can learn from whatever. And yeah, so anyhow, he was like, building me up this way to accept what I was doing, but I still don't find any, like, problem with escorting. Mm -hmm. I think it's a cool thing, and it's a service. I agree. I think there's a lot of, I mean, especially since having this podcast, and I've had a lot of escorts on, and, like, Mm -hmm. people have worked at the Bunny Ranch, and I've had some really interesting conversations that I feel like have really changed, like, my view on maybe what it was before. And I wasn't really against it before. Right. But I guess I think I just never really thought about it that much. But there's a lot of people who consider it to be like a form of therapy, you know? I mean, touch, human touch, that kind of intimacy is thing that we all crave. And it's not that easy for some guys to get it. That's right. And like their careers don't allow for it. So an escort can come in and give them what they need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they don't have time Mm -hmm. to dedicate a a relationship, but we all need sex. Absolutely. And the exchange of neurons is real. Like people with animals, like that's why they're so happy because mm-hmm. the animals go run around in the yard and bring it back and you pet and exchange yeah. happiness. Yeah. I mean, we are <laughs> gregarious creatures. Right. Right. Yeah. I love what we do because our industry, it celebrates the origins of life. Mm. And I think that's beautiful. I love that. I've never heard anybody put it that way before, but I like it. Me I really too. like it. Well, you know, you got to like think about how society has really made us in this industry feel like shame. We're the Mm -hmm. only um, industry that's being filmed that doesn't get residuals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is that, why? Like, Mm. why isn't our image just as important as someone who's doing mainstream Hollywood? We're all acting. Mm -hmm. You know, we're actresses at the end of the day. But Mm -hmm. because of, like, people having this hang-up on whether or not, I guess, you're having what type of sex you're having. I don't know. It just seems so. There's definitely an idea that sex workers are disposable compared right. to like mainstream. Right. Actors, I don't for like sure. that. It's not right. Yeah. It's not right. There's a place and a seat in the house for everybody. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then when we come back, um, we're, we're going to find out how Audrey took that final leap that made her who she is today. So stick around guys. We'll be right back. All right, guys, let's get real for a second. Do you want stronger erections, stronger orgasms? And what if I told you that you could achieve this through an incredibly pleasurable activity that I know you all do, masturbation? Yes, you heard me right. If you're looking for a natural way to improve your sexual health, you've got to check out the Perennium Massager from Butter Wellness. This little device is a game changer. It's an external massager of the perineum, that little spot between the anus and the balls that you probably haven't been paying all that much attention to. 
By increasing blood flow to the pelvic region through stimulation, you are naturally increasing the strength of your orgasms and your erections. Plus, massaging the perineum not only leads to stronger erections, but it also strengthens your pelvic floor muscles, which can help with ED and even prevent prostate enlargement. And the best part? Butter Wellness has bundled the Perennium Massager with their water-based lubricant in the Butter Starter Kit. The lubricant is pH balanced, lightweight, and gives you that smooth, natural glide, whether you're flying solo or with a partner. And this is a great couple's toy, by the way, if you want to try something new. So here's the deal. Right now, Butter Wellness is offering our listeners 15% off of your entire order when you use code HOLLY at checkout. That's B-U-T-T-E-R-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S and use code HOLLY for 15% off the Perennium Massager or the Butter Starter Kit. Hit the link in the episode description and start taking control of your sexual health today. All right, everybody, we are back. Okay, so Audrey, we left off where you guys were escorting. Otto was in school. You were in school. And then... I was like, this just is rubbing me the wrong way. You know, we're trying to be responsible for guiding people's souls. is <laughs> a, a couple in the church. <laughs> and, you know, then we're going and escorting behind the scenes and like living these, we're living a double life. Yeah, it's a very double life. 100%. And so it just didn't feel right to me because I don't like lying. I never mm -hmm. have. I'm very transparent. And mm -hmm. so when I got in the industry and I was like, tell everybody you're 18 and I was like 24, it offended me to no end because <laughs> I was like, no, I'm proud of being 24. Like yeah. I didn't want to hide my life from yeah. people, although I see it as a form of protection, potentially his motive but yeah. i mean i like once you do this you do it you show people the inside of yourself mm -hmm. literally literally so yeah. it's like why not just go ahead and be fully transparent yeah, and I agree you know let people see you so yeah okay so how did porn come calling i didn't want to be involved in something i couldn't agree with mm -hmm. morally and ethically like mm -hmm. the two lives it just it bothered me it rubbed me wrong so i was like look this isn't right i can't i can't support it like if you want to be with me we're gonna have to figure out something else mm -hmm. and um we're already in the sex business and i had found out that he had worked with um candida royale in new okay. york city and uh that was during 2000s. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I was like, okay, so you've already done a porn. We've done this escorting. There's really, you make a lot more money doing porn than escorting. I'm like, we're trying to build a life. Like, let's just, let's just do it. I was yeah. like, let's go get in porn. I mean, I, I think we're already sexy and mm -hmm. we're doing this all the time. Like, I think we like this life. I liked the sexy life more than the fake, like, religious thing that we were doing mm -hmm. just didn't yeah yeah so I encouraged the let's go be in porn and okay. he was like are you sure about this like you know and I mean on, well I'm being honest and transparent he ended up being physical with me and I was like that ended it all and I was like you can't touch your wife this way and like want to go be a priest and be responsible for yeah. guiding people. So I knew there was like some need to heal and like potentially like work on our relationship, but it wasn't going to be through religion. It needed to be through porn, which is what I think we were more inclined to want to do. Mm -hmm. Like, Did you feel like that double life was causing friction between you guys? And did you feel like that's maybe why he laid hands on you? Is that like what you're thinking was? Um, you know, why someone decides to put their hands on someone else, I just, I don't think there's any ever reason. I don't, right. I can't, I, I can't conceptualize it still. I'm just thinking like what would, in your head, right, as a 19 year old, like were, I was just wondering if that was like a rationale for you where you were like, okay, we need to move into porn because then we're like living a more honest life, so to speak, and this friction in our relationship won't exist. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what was your first scene and, like, who did you contact? Like, uh, how did you get was, there? This is the fun part, like, because we all fall in love for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
at one point, Otto and I, it was very good. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, planning the porn career was cool because he got an ABN magazine. And he's like, all right, look through this magazine, pick out the star that you want to be like and like, you know, model yourself after and like, you know, let's create an image and a brand for you. Like, what name do you want? Uh, you know, first, last name and like, how are we going to approach this? But we approached it in a very like planned business type yeah. way. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And I chose Belladonna. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was, you know, Jenna Jameson was big, but like I relate it more to like a hardcore sex scene yeah. instead of the like beautiful sex. Like, I, I yeah. just, I wasn't there at that time. And so that's how I wanted to express myself. Right. And Belladonna was definitely hardcore. was doing that. Yeah, Her tattoos, I saw her on the cover of like a stripper magazine. I was like, oh wow, she's so hot. And I think that bad girl boy image very much appealed to me. Yeah. And then she stuck a baseball bat of her ass. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. Who could forget I, that? <laughs> well, I mean, I recreated it. I did it as well because I was like, that's my idol. I have to do what she did. And like, out of Louisville Slugger. And yeah, I got taken out of a lot of the scenes that I did because it's, what do they call that, obscene? <laughs> <laughs> I was in a federal court case for obscenity, literally. Oh, my God. Okay, I want to get to that. So, wait, hold on. Okay, so the baseball bat, the Louisville Slugger, is that like a, that's like a smaller, is that a smaller bat or is that the the standard? Standard. Oh. Yeah. I always thought that like she put like up like a, like a, um, the smaller bat up her Maybe butt. she did because you know but how then photos, she went to one you know her. how photos can, yeah. it's all about perspective. So it could have been. Because I, I remember someone saying like, oh, Belladonna, because I remember that was a big deal when she did that. Like Belladonna stuck a baseball bat up her butt and someone was like, oh, that was a little league baseball bat. <laughs> like, I, I, I didn't want to give her the credit because it was like smaller than an average like or league baseball bat. But you you went for like the like. I didn't know it was a small one. I guess I assumed it was the big one and I wasn't trying to one up anybody. I was just like, you know, I assumed it was the regular size. I could be wrong. Look, I could be wrong. I don't want to take away from Bellatona's moment of the baseball bat up her butt. So if it was not a little league baseball bat, I'm very sorry. And I didn't want to put that out there. But I just remember having this conversation with someone and it was funny to me because like sticking a baseball bat up your butt, like no matter kind of what size it is, is a lot. It and is. the fact that this person was like trying to play it down, like, oh, it was only a, was a smaller bat. I'm like, it's still a bat, dude. But right, anyways. Right. Trying to take her thunder. <laughs> 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 Let me see you stick a bat up your ass. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that bat's too small. <laughs> Pussy, are you showing me something? What is it? It is a smaller bat. Oh, oh okay. okay. Masha's looking it up. Okay. Well, okay. Well, you know what, Audrey? I didn't then mean you to. then you win. You win the baseball bat up the butt competition. We're all winners. <laughs> We're all winners. It's it's the you know it's the effort that counts. <laughs> okay, so you model yourself off to Belladonna. You and Otto have this conversation. You approach the adult industry in a very like specific, um, planned out way. What's your first scene? Dirty Debut Haunts with Ed Powers. Oh, I think that series is still going. So it was like a formula for girls like back in the day, yeah. like how you made it big, right? Yeah. So Dirty Debut Haunts was one of the series that a lot of girls did that would win either Best New Starlet or Female Performer of the Year. And mm -hmm. like those were the things I was gunning for. I was mm -hmm. like, I want to be the best. You know, I was in beauty pageants and a cheerleader, so it was just like naturally inside of me to be that competitive, yeah. but not in a negative way. You know, yeah. it's good to be competitive, I think. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you want to be the best you can be. Right. You want to stick the biggest butt You're only as good as your butt. <laughs> right. You're only as good as your last scene. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So who did you perform with? Was it with Otto? No. No. Did Otto perform? I can't remember. At the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so he performed before me with Candida Royale. So right. he already had but, some credits. But, in, but when you got in. It was me first. Uh -huh. And then we started focusing on his career. But okay. we built me and then him. Okay. But he already had that in his. Because he became a director, right? Right. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, but he was a performer before that. Okay, so, gotcha. Yes. Okay, so your first scene, who was it with? I think it was, uh, so the first, like, real scene, because I don't want to count, and I don't want to say this, because that's not, 
Ed Powers isn't like a performer to me. Like he is, but not in the pool of like, you know, the active like males at the time. So mm-hmm. it was like he only worked in his series. It wasn't mm-hmm. like he was working with other people. So right. like active male performer was um, John Strong. Ah. Yes. And you know, he's still going strong. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. He's got his own VR series. Cool. Yeah. Well, I would love to see him again. He was so amazing. Like, yeah. And it was. He's still like a super solid performer. It was very embarrassing. I I pooped all over the place because I, it was like my first anal scene and I was really nervous. And I didn't know that the enema bottles that had like the oil in it, yeah. you take that out and use water. No one had taught me anything yeah. really. You know, I mean, I'd done a little bit prior, but oh my goodness, he was so nice to me because I was like <laughs> a mess. I was a Literally. mess. And I mean, you know, that would devastate most people to be yeah. like, I'm never returning to this. Yeah. I'm just shit everywhere. And I'm like <laughs> trying to make it cool. I'm like, is it funny? It's flying everywhere. <laughs> you know, because you're just trying to make yourself comfortable. You're like, Jesus. And it's like you go put more enema in and then it just gets stuck. Like, oh no! You, I don't know if that's ever happened to yeah. you, but like I think it's a nerve thing. It, or, like, like it's okay. So you probably had um, some enema, like fluid gets stuck in like a pocket mm-hmm. of your colon. Um, yeah, these it's. Uh, <laughs> I had a colonoscopy a couple of months ago, and I learned so much about the colon that I didn't need to know. Um, and yeah, there's like pockets that can appear in your colon. It's called a... Di- I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking yes, about? Yes, Diureticulitis. There's two different something. kinds. Okay, okay. I'm yeah, because like- <laughs> there's one kind which like most people have, and then there's another kind which is worse. Anyways, there's little pockets okay. in your colon that can things can sit in. And sometimes, yeah, with enemas, um, if you don't get all the water out, if you don't clean out properly, it can sit in that little pocket. And then when a penis comes in, right. it prompts it to come out right. in a place that you didn't want it to. I couldn't get the water out. And I mm. kept putting more in to try oh, to pull no. pull it out. And I'm like no experience, right? Like no one You hadn't like, like cleaned out the night before. Well, I hadn't had any guidance. And like when I was yeah. doing it with auto, like I didn't really like clean out because we would just kind of like wipe it off, yeah. you know, because it wasn't like really that messy. And I was in your personal life, it's not like you're like ATMing you're, or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. I was just brand new. Yeah. I was like putting a strap one on a pillow in front of a mirror trying to like hold myself right. Like, because it's so hard to take a dick up your ass when you're new and look sexy at the same time. <laughs> you're like, you know, so I'm like, that's what I was practicing yeah. in the mirror before I got in the industry. Yeah. Not the cleaning part, which I wish I would have added that, but yeah. I just didn't know. Right. So like, yeah, I'm like just trying to get comfortable with the dick up my ass because I'm new to anal and yeah. it's all, like all the exit feeling going on. And then you're like, how do I make this angry face? Like, oh my gosh, this is, it felt so funny. But it's the beginning of me understanding how porn is not as sexy as people think it is. Yeah. It's very performed and, you know, catered to an audience. Yeah, it's a fantasy. You're creating it a is. fantasy. It yeah. really is. It's not reality. It's not at all. And yeah. i that's part of the industry that I hope somewhat fuses to be a different, uh, you know, approach. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find my words here. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. Because, you know, I want people to see real sex. Because I have a lot of fans who were like 13 watching my porn that I've met now who are like 33 to 36 or whatever, you know, and they're like, oh my God, you taught me how to have sex. And I'm like, you learned how to have sex from porn? That's not good. I mean, porn's yeah. great for like a visual and like turning you on. It's yeah. entertainment, but, but it's, it's not, not how tool. you have sex. Yeah, It's really not. And yeah. it's interesting how misconstrued it is by so many 30-something-year-olds that I've met that have you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) learned how to jack off to me, which is such a cool thing. Yeah. It's so cool. I think about all the cum that's been spilled over me and I'm like, man, I wonder if we could fill up a pool. Like (laughs) how much, you know? (laughs) Are these the thoughts that keep you up at night? (laughs) Well, you know, just you have to have random thoughts like that sometimes, I think, because it's like, wow, there's been a lot of years go by and a lot of like, you know, different decades of like generations of guys be like, I am watching your porn, you know. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) Cool. I'm only in my second decade, but still it's 
Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Um, okay, so you have a <laughs> shitty experience with John Strong. And he's the best. So sweet. Me yes, meaning not not him. So sweet. Didn't bad. make me feel like crap about the fact that I'm shitting all over him yeah. and like everybody's there for hours waiting. And and the problem was is I didn't clean out before I came yeah. to set. And so I'm on set with my nerves and everybody's waiting for me. Yeah. And that's like Part of it that is like you need to do it before you yeah. really do, and yeah. that was a hard lesson learned. <laughs> yeah. How did the scene come out like afterwards? After what I assume is heavily edited, right? So I made it a point to not watch my movies mm. because I didn't, and I didn't read my reviews. I wanted to just have an authentic performance and not get in my head about what I saw mm -hmm. because I don't see myself the way that I think other people see myself. Mm -hmm. And so when you start getting like picky about like what you look like or like what you're wearing or how you're look, like it just, it takes away from what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to stay focused on the objective, which was fucking. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, oh my goodness, I said I was going to try to not cuss someone. It's okay. But no, I really did like want to fuck on mm -hmm. camera and like have that experience of like intense sex that mm -hmm. you don't have with your partner at home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how did you feel after that scene? Like just about doing porn in general? I was very grateful that John was so sweet to me because I feel like if he had been in any way made me feel like shame or like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I'm stinky or weird because I'm pooping everywhere, you know, I would have like felt differently and maybe not as confident about proceeding forward. But I've worked through a lot of that in porn, like being embarrassed and mm -hmm. realizing that the things that all people are usually embarrassed about, like, you know, queefing and like getting air in your vagina or ass and then like turning over and you're like, <laughs> it's yeah. like you know, <laughs> it just becomes like this thing where you realize like everybody does it. It's yeah. not embarrassing. And so it helps. I've definitely like stopped the camera at times. I'm like, okay, hold, hold on guys. I'm like, get it out. And then the girl's like, okay, thank you. Right. And she gets it out. I'm like, okay, now we can roll. But because yeah, it happens to everybody. <laughs> it does. And I still find myself, I just shot with Alex Legend. We did some content together and like he has a giant penis, right? And I'm like in doggy. He's fucking my ass. And I'm all like, oh my God, the air comes out. And I'm still like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the first scene that you did where you felt like, okay, I'm now I'm getting this like you realize you kind of felt like you were coming into your star power. Wow. That's a great question. That's a great question because I feel like I performed for everyone else for a long time and like just kind of went through the motions, so to speak. So like to come into like my self, I think is to feel comfortable, I guess. Is that what you mean more of? Like to where I wasn't nervous? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I did a gangbang with Ashley Long mm -hmm. for Anabolic Diabolic. And that was 20 guys. And after I handled that many guys, I felt like I could do anything mm. in this industry because like that's a lot of energy. And it's very powerful as a woman when you're like, wow, I just, well, I mean, Ashley helped me. And that mm -hmm. <laughs> that was great. But still, your first gangbang in 20 dudes, that's a lot. Like, most girls are, like, only six, maybe 10 mm -hmm. for their first one. Mm -hmm. And here I am, like, 20. I'm like, you know, but that's... I just very thought, Chloe, who was just on before you, said that she's planning to do her first gangbang. She's like, no more than five. <laughs> well, honestly, it's more enjoyable with five to six because it's manageable. Everybody yeah. gets a, you know, a turn. And otherwise, yeah. like, guys are waiting in line. It's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's awkward. like, it's a train. It's, yeah. it is awkward. But, yeah. like, you lose yourself in the energy of all those guys. And then by the end of it, having them all, like, come all over you, you're kind of like, wow, you've, you feel this power, and then you realize and you start to make the connect. I started to make the connection between sex and power, and like I can handle anything after twenty dudes, and like you know, yeah. <laughs> so it was probably the gangbang that made me feel like I could do it and feel comfortable. <laughs> wow. So you know, there's a lot of people who feel like gangbangs are, 
you know, exploitative and that they're degrading to women. However, I've spoken to so many women on this podcast who say that they find it to be the opposite. They find it to be empowering, which sounds like it exactly really what you just said. So maybe for someone who's watching this going like, how can gangbangs be empowering for women? Could you explain to them like why it feels that way for you? Because you have a group of 20 men who are animalistic with their nature at the point that they want to have sex with you because it's a very animalistic thing that we're doing when mm-hmm. we're having sex, right? I mean, it's primal. Sorry, it's primal, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so having all of those guys with this primal desire to like put themselves inside of you, it's so empowering to know that you're controlling that many guys at once mm. and that your presence and energy is what's creating their dicks being hard and waiting in line and like it's all being controlled by you which is a cool feeling mm-hmm. you know and like you really do have the power and it's not like degrading at all it's empowering it is mm-hmm. i think that it's only degrading if you don't want to be there yeah and so why would you sign up I think that's the difference, right? Because, I mean, I think you can attest to the fact that, like, not everybody should be in porn, right? It's not the right job for everybody. It's not the right job for everybody. It's not the right job for most people, right? But It really isn't. It It really isn't. So there are, you know, people who get into the adult industry and they do these things that they're initially not comfortable with and their sexuality is not in a place where the porn industry is the right choice for them. And then they have these game bangs and because probably they feel like they've made the wrong choice so they're already entering that scene with this feeling of being disempowered and they don't feel like they can speak up and they have a bad experience. And then they go out and tell the world how awful that was experience was for them and therefore, like, it's, it's pre- the same for everybody. You know right, what I mean? Like, right, No, it's all so individual, but, yeah. like, you know, it's pre-programming in a society that's run heavily by a patriarchal model. And yeah. so we have to deal with this shame as a woman that wants to be free and have a body count just Mm -hmm. like you know men are popular or like somehow a better lover because they've had a lot of Mm -hmm. women or notches in their belt or whatever but a woman has a body count and it's like a negative connotation surrounding around that and i don't think so yeah i think it's fucking cool when a woman can say yeah i'm really secure in myself and my sexuality i love sex i like having sex with multiple partners and this is what I like doing this is how I like expressing my sexuality is through lots of partners. And I mean, what are we here to do on earth other than to like experience love in many different forms? And sex is just another form of love, really. Mm -hmm. It is. Whether it's intense and like, you know, kind of what some people might call rough sex or like, you know, passionate sex that's like softcore, it's still like wrapped in love, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. because you have to have those emotions that create a wet vagina and a hard dick. Mm -hmm. And that has something to do with love. Love comes in many forms, though. Mm -hmm. Sound bites coming out of this girl. Damn. (laughs) Good. Good shit. Uh, What's the craziest hardcore scene you were ever a part of? Oh, wow. Okay. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't even a scene. It, well, let me, because you asked for a scene. So let me think about this. Okay. Well, no, no, no. Tell me if it's a movie, then yeah. Well, no, it wasn't a movie. It was just a private party. It was an experience after uh, the Berlin Festival. Venus. Venus. Mm -hmm. Yes. My favorite Mm-hmm. ever it's so good it's coming up <laughs> i know i well i'm a terrible planner and honestly <laughs> i discounted how much like auto did help with my career now that yeah. i'm running it myself and i see like how i kind of had a handler but it didn't help me yeah he should have like empowered me by letting me do it instead of doing it for me but i see how guys use that as a way to manipulate right or whether it was intentional of like, oh, I just want to take care of you, but yeah. I think it's more manipulation. Yeah. You know, because you want people, knowledge is power. Yeah. So everything was done for me at that point. Now I'm doing it all myself. So I have a new respect for <laughs> to handling your own career. Yeah. And <laughs> what goes behind it. And in a different, the industry is so different now. But before we get off on that tangent, I want to hear about this crazy sex. Oh, yeah. So we were in Berlin and oh my goodness. A beautiful 
girl named Mia, which means missing in action for her because she's always off doing crazy stuff. Okay. She was such a cool performer. She was an escort that traveled and not a porn star, but Mm -hmm. was there to be the entertainment for the party after the show. Mm -hmm. And so she's like smoking a cigar with her pussy. And then she's like, I've got another really cool trick. And she prolapses her anus, but like three inches out of her ass. And like, I didn't think that there was anything that could like cause me to feel like a little ill to my stomach. (laughs) And because like, I'm open to all, like, I love weird Thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm in porn. I you lick st- ass. I have to do a parasite. Like, you cleanse. stuck a baseball bat up your butt. Right? Like, like, yeah, yeah, right? It was like, so when she prolapsed, and I'd never seen that, I'd never heard of it. It was my first experience with it. It's called but, like rose budding, isn't yes, it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so I was told to lick her rose bud. Oh, and like, God. At that point in my career, I was all about pleasing and I didn't have any boundaries and I, had no idea how to form those yet. No. So I did it and it was um it was the most intense thing I've ever done because of the way you feel right now. The way you feel right <laughs> now. So intense. I was like, how is that able to happen? And are you okay? Is like, it gonna go back in? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then so you always think about like, oh, people blow their ass out doing anal and sticking ball bats up your ass. I mean, people yeah. have asked me many times, have you blown your ass out? I'm like, how do you blow your ass out? Is a prolapse anus a blown out ass? I don't know. I don't know either. I think I guess. Or is a blown out ass one that like won't close? <laughs> or is it like you know what I mean? I love these girls and guys who are like, I've never done anal. And then like you get back there and you start playing with their ass. They're like, oh, yeah, you've never done anal. You can totally tell when someone's done anal. <laughs> <laughs> My second husband like tried to hide it. Right. And then like I saw that I was like, no, you do anal. And like I was coming out of porn at the yeah. time. So I was like, let me play with your ass. And he was like, Okay, and like no one's ever done that before, right? Right, (laughs) and I found a bunch of toys and everything. But I'm into like sex, no matter what it is. I love pegging a guy's ass. It's the best. Yeah. Okay. All right. So okay. (laughs) Okay. So Mia. So she prolapses her anus. You. How 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 was that experience? It was intense. I I like I said. I learned from that experience that like. I would do anything I was told Mm. because I was just that like little step fruit wife that Mm -hmm. was um, an automatron. I even had someone say I like looked like an empty shell of a person in Mm -hmm. a documentary I did nine to five, Mm -hmm. which, you know, hit hard at first, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, processing that point and Mm -hmm. so forth. So, yeah, I just was playing along with everything, you know, just kind of acting out my life existing in it, Mm -hmm. pleasing everyone around me. But it felt good because everyone was like so happy about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like to please. I'm a genuine giver and Mm -hmm. I don't expect anything in return. To see someone happy about what I can do for them and sexually at the time, that's what I was providing just was amazing to me. Mm -hmm. I love making people feel good. It's Mm -hmm. great. But now I have boundaries. It's different. <laughs> I, you know, I've learned a lot about. I was, I was gonna ask because, like, obviously, you're still a very like sexually free person, but you seem to understand now the difference between pleasing people and experimenting and and maybe pushing your own boundaries for your own reasons. Right. Like, how have you come to figure out that balance? So. Being attached to auto and the industry being so extreme at the time that I came in, I was a part of like push. I I did double anal for the first time with Brandon Iron and Auto, mm-hmm. and it was on a Skeeter or Bridget Kirko set. Mm-hmm. So all these names are like wow, God, these I'm, are bringing back memories. I haven't heard these names in so. This long. is like the hardcore dark yeah. side of porn. You I mean, yeah, because you're right. You did come in right when the internet first started, and shit went crazy. It was like what I call like the porn Olympics. It was like what's the craziest thing you can do yeah. because all of a sudden all of these barriers were removed. Because before, when it was all on tangible products like magazines or DVDs or VHSs, there were different rules in different states, right? So I remember, like, right. sp- specifically when we were shooting for magazines, you know, we had to shoot, like, softcore. There wasn't any penetration because, like, this was illegal in Alabama and this was illegal there. And so, like, 
you know, and, and shipping stuff across state lines would be a problem. When the internet came along, it was, you know, like international waters. But still, though, because I was in a movie um, that got sent to New Zealand, they cut my scene out of the movie and I went to like sign that movie and everything. But they had like deemed it obscene mm-hmm. because of the level of extreme porn that was yeah. going on in the industry. And it was to me, I think I'm going to say it's a dark era in yeah. porn because it was just pushing the envelope of like the extremes and like what can we get the girls to do yes i feel like like how much can we potentially degrade you depending on what lens you had on to look mm-hmm. at it because everyone feels different about these kind of fetishes and like kinks i guess because mm-hmm. some people do enjoy humiliation so mm-hmm. but uh so i don't want to speak too broadly here, but like it was dark and that people were doing things that they were compromising their own moral and ethical like self because their agent was pushing it on them. And I know this because there's a lot of stories that have come out now about agents and agents who have gone to prison and people who are now facing the consequence of what they did during the time that I was in the industry. And mm-hmm. so girls were treated completely differently. Mm-hmm. And it was, like I said, yes, yeah, super hardcore, always very dark in my opinion. Because to ask someone to stick two things in their ass, like what is the like what is the point other than to just see if you can like either hurt the girl or like I don't know. I don't know if that was just how I was attaching to it at the time because I was with someone who made me feel like it was like their way of kind of being passive aggressive because although they said they accepted me being in porn and being with other men, I think it drove them insane like mentally to see me enjoy that and it made them jealous. So they mm. challenged the person challenged me by seeing like how extreme can I make you have sex and like, you know, interesting anal, anal and like all all this like very hardcore stuff. Right, that, like right. I don't think is natural. But like I said, I was such a pleaser that I was all about like, you know, pleasing my husband and making sure he was impressed with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then you won, like, quite a few AVN awards. Like, how did it feel to win, like, you know, AVN Female Performer of the Year in 2006? It was amazing because I felt like my hard work was recognized. Like, the girls that get that award really put in the work. Mm -hmm. They really do. And, like, I was up against some girls that year that got nominated that I was, like, I don't know if I put in the work to do that, like, you know, and it was something, it was a goal to get that, but like everything that all the girls were doing, me, Melissa Loren, Sandra Romaine, you know, I just, I felt validated 100% Mm -hmm. because like all the other girls were doing just as hardcore stuff as me. I felt like they were just as good performers as me. And like, I didn't know that I was going to get it, but it was very validating Mm -hmm. and it made me feel super good because I had compromised so much of myself And I didn't realize it at that point. Mm -hmm. But now in retrospect, I go back and I look at the things that I did to please the industry and my man. Mm -hmm. But it was like a circus, honestly. It felt like a circus. I called myself an athlete after a while. And I learned how to detach and transmutate the energy that I felt like was sometimes not sexy from the people directing me to do it, but more like it's not abusive or anything, but just like kind of being mean. It's passive aggressive mm-hmm. as fuck in some cases, like, and especially on certain sets yeah. that I was wanting. I guess I don't need to be naming as many names. As I'm just such a transparent person. Yeah, and I okay. don't like ever being a liar. And I was encouraged to lie at the beginning of my career. So I guess that's why I'm so adamant about just being a truth teller at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's good for people to see the industry for what it is and, you know, what it is then and what it is now, which yeah. is totally different and in a lot of very good ways. And I'm glad to have been a part of all of it, though, because, you know, it's the experience that matters, whether good or bad. And, you know, you learn. Yeah. You learn. There's no mistakes, only experience if you learn from it, right? Yeah, always, always. So, like, things that I guess that I'm talking about that may, I hope your audience doesn't think that, like, I'm traumatized anymore. I'm, like, totally healed, and I love this job, and I think it's wonderful that I had to go through that so that I could understand like you know the human psyche and the different like waves of it because it's changed completely Mm -hmm. like how men and women interact and just 
it's cool to have experienced it. I wouldn't change anything. And I actually was really good at the hardcore stuff. And after doing it, started liking it. Yeah. Because it was, I mean, I had no choice. I was kind of like, I felt like, no, it was my choice. But you would have done it differently. Right. I like with what you know now. Exactly. Exactly. Because yeah. I feel like I do love hardcore sex. And like I probably would have like pushed those limits just in a different way, mm -hmm. like on my own terms. Yeah. Right. I Without understand. the direction of like people who I think were just like getting wild and jaded because like why you know yeah. and i guess it's because like you've seen so much normal sex that we have to do something outlandish cuz like what are we going to do next i don't right, know right right it's like all this step porn now yeah it, it went from hardcore to like step porn <laughs> <laughs> or like stay call me kind of it's, porn it's always something <laughs> so why did you decide to leave porn i needed a break I needed a break. My relationship with Otto was so eye-opening and intense, and I had to process. I yeah. really needed to process. And, um, yeah, just we all get burnt out in what we do, and I needed time to realize, like, everything I had experienced and just take a moment mm -hmm. and regroup and not be the one, like, having to go to work. So I remarried someone that had, you know— I stay-at-home mom at that point. Okay. And How was that transition for it, you? <laughs> it was great to have the break because, like, my double life prior to getting into porn, like, I was always, like, the little, like, Stepford wife type of, like, you know, mm -hmm. clean the house. And so the housewife role just, like, I fell right back into it, and it was great to have somebody, like, not in the industry as my mate Mm -hmm. respecting me in a different way mm -hmm. and like wanting to have sex with me in a different way. And it was healing. It was good. I enjoyed it. I needed the break and I needed to regroup because the beginning of my career was not, um, it's not that it was bad. I just, I think that I would have done things differently and approached things a little differently. And, um, worked with a bunch more companies like that I didn't get to work with. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and I think could have like made my career different, yeah, you know, but I was attached to energy that I was letting dictate my choices and mm -hmm. things, so yeah, yeah, so what made you decide to come back into the industry? I left the industry with you know an image that didn't belong to me. Mm -hmm. it was an image that was geared towards the market, what directors wanted to see, what my ex-auto wanted to see. And so it was like just catering to everyone else. And so I was like, this just is not how I want to end it. I don't want people to like see that part of me because that's not really real. Mm -hmm. It was contrived and I mean, just played out. I don't mm -hmm. know how to say that. I didn't know who I was. I was just doing what I thought everybody wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. But it, I am a super sexy person. I love sex. I ooze sex. It, sex is my thing for sure. Mm -hmm. And so returning to the industry, I am showing people the real me. Okay. The part of me that like is full of boundaries, honestly. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, Don't you love the boundary checklist now? I really do. How wild is that? I it's great. <laughs> it did and then, not exist in your time. No, and there's intimacy coordinators now yeah. and people to make sure that like you're happy. It's a whole different yeah. business and it's so cool to see. And I'm like I said, I'm grateful to have been a part of the dark part of it mm -hmm. because I can help other girls now in the industry and like make sure that things don't ever go back that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I would write, like to be a leader and a director and like not just a performer. I mean, I did some directing, but I'm ready to like step into a different role in the industry. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a place for me and I want people to see a very healthy, happy, healed version of me and that porn didn't ruin, you know, how I feel about my sexuality or anything like that. And I want to come back and like, you know, still be a part of it. And mm -hmm. I love our industry. It's a very cool business. And I've struggled with the shame aspect and like, you know, kind of like the double life thing. Yeah. Because like, even though I 
took a break and I went and I was a mom and all of that, I still had the desire to like kind of come back through that because I'm like thinking like, oh my gosh, what would I, you know, you're processing your whole career at that point <laughs> and what I, what I've done differently. And, you know, instead of like just wondering, I'm doing it now. Mm-hmm. I'm coming back and I'm like, no, I want to be here. I want to do this. Like, I'm never going to be this age ever again. Mm -hmm. MILFs are the second biggest genre in our industry right now. So I'm like, go have fun and enjoy it in a different way. And I am completely enjoying the industry in a new way. And honestly, me in a new way. And I thought I knew everything about sex. I've got the awards to prove it. (laughs) Like, you know, but it, it wasn't... It wasn't what I thought it was. It was like, I've learned so much about myself, like just re-entering and like the time I've spent processing what happened and um, becoming a woman. Yeah. You know, I'm a woman now. I was just a little girl back then. and Yeah. It's coming back and like reclaiming your sexuality in, in like a different way. And yeah. I mean, and now you have, you know, with these personal content platforms, like OnlyFans, and I'm sure you're on that. Mm-hmm. Like, girls have so much more control over their careers and over their income and feel safer establishing boundaries. They're not afraid of being blacklisted in the way they were before. And companies really took a notice of that. And that's, you know, it's created such positive change in our industry with the boundary checklists, like you said, and like talent coordinators or the intimacy coordinators. I always say, I do believe that right now is the best time to get into the adult industry, like than ever, like the power is in the hand of hands of the performers in a way that it never was before. Right. And are you feeling that? I I was in school to be a barber when I decided to start doing OnlyFans to supplement my income and pay for school, and I loved OnlyFans. I was like, wow, this is what has needed to happen for so long, and I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner. Yeah. But I'm grateful for this platform because it does give the power to the performer and. I started, when I started taking control of my image, being able to like shoot myself, put myself in the best light, whereas like I was putting that power in other people's hands. And like, honestly, people weren't doing their job because like I am a photographer and an artist, not on your level. I totally love and respect you and your mom's work. And so when I would see bad photographs of myself. I'm like, this is just a bad production. Yeah. It's not the model. It's like, you know what I mean? And so when you got, when I was able to take control of that, it felt really good because I was able to show my fans like good work because not good work always comes out of porn, obviously. And so, yeah, it's nice to show people the way I see myself and not the way a director or a makeup artist or my ex or anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. So um, normally we do a separate segment for the Patreon questions, but we are running out of time. So I'm just going to ask them right here. So you're welcome, everybody. You get to access them. Um, Michael uh, sent in (laughs) the same question that he always does. Um, But we kind of already answered this, I feel like. I'm going to read it, Michael, just so you don't feel like I skipped your question. But I do think that Audrey pretty much answered this. Um, Hi, Audrey. I have two questions. Do you enjoy anal and vaginal orgasms in your personal and professional life? Have you done or did double anal or vagina or ever did triple anal because you seem like a person like you doing that extreme stuff? I do like doing extreme things and me learning how to transmutate the energy of like feeling like people pressuring me to do the double anal and things like that. Like I kind of figured out how to just go outside of my head and like it, Mm -hmm. frankly. And I guess I was trained almost like a soldier. (laughs) I really do feel like that. But now I'm able to, like, enjoy it because, like, during my training and boot camp, (laughs) (laughs) you realize that anal really is enjoyable after Mm -hmm. you get past a certain point, but it takes practice. Yeah. Just like anything. (laughs) So I do love anal and anal orgasms are way better now that I'm older Mm -hmm. than when I was younger. Mm. And I prefer anal orgasms over my vaginal ones now, kind of. Well, not kind of. I do. I said this the other day. (laughs) (laughs) And then the last question is from Hugo. He says, what do you think differentiates a legendary performer from a very good one? 
their approach to the industry. It's mm-hmm. not about just coming in and making quick cash and, you know, being just a pretty face. It's about coming into a business like as a business-minded person wanting to make an impact in an in industry, like not just be a pretty face that is a good fuck because there's so much more to like being legendary. Like you change something in your industry. Your Mm -hmm. presence brings something in the industry. And like, you know, you're a part of your community. You're a part of like proactively making it a better place and, you know, being involved in that way. Yeah. All right. Well, Audrey, thank you so much for coming. I feel like we could talk for like another like two hours. I do too. If you wanted to do a part two, I would love to. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I know you were like, this is such an interesting interview. Um, I think that everyone's going to really enjoy it. And thank you so much for coming on. And it's been such a pleasure to like finally sit down and get to talk to you after all these years. It's really cool. Right. I'm like fangirling out on you too. I hope (laughs) that you'll come out of retirement and maybe shoot me. Maybe. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) Um, In the meantime, can you tell everyone where they can find you online? Yes, I am at the Audrey Hollander on Instagram and at the real Audrey Hollander triple X on Twitter. TikTok is just Audrey Hollander. (laughs) And then I'm like, am I missing any platforms? OnlyFans? Oh, OnlyFans is just Audrey Hollander. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Um, And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter or X and on Instagram. Um, Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filtered to support this podcast and watch interviews like this live and hollylinks.com for links to all my other platforms. Thank you guys so much for watching. (laughs) 